I found myself in an incredibly uncomfortable situation at my sister-in-law's bachelorette party. And to understand what happened, I need to provide some context about the family dynamics. I'm 25 and my husband, Nate, is 26. We've been together for quite some time, and throughout our relationship, it's been obvious that Nate and his sister, whom I'll call S, have a complicated sibling relationship. Their dynamic has always been strained, and a lot of it comes down to how their parents treated them growing up. It was always clear who the favorite was. My in-laws have always coddled S, treating her like the golden child. As long as anyone can remember, if S even hinted that she wanted something, she got it, no questions asked. There were no compromises. She never heard the word no. For example, if she wanted the latest iPhone, my in-laws made it happen, even if it meant putting off buying something for themselves. If there was a school trip she wanted to go on, no matter how expensive, she went. Meanwhile, Nate was left to fend for himself. He was more on the nerdy side growing up, interested in video games, science fiction novels, and tinkering with his computer. He wasn't unpopular, but he wasn't the social butterfly his sister was either. Because he wasn't into sports and didn't care about fitting in with the cool kids, he often got picked on at school. My in-laws never made it any easier for him. They would straight up tell him things like, why can't you be more like your sister? Or, maybe if you were more outgoing, people would like you more. It was as if they were completely oblivious to how damaging those comparisons were. They saw S as the perfect, shining example of how a child should be. Popular, pretty, and always in the spotlight. Meanwhile, Nate was just Nate. He was expected to somehow transform into someone he wasn't. Someone more socially acceptable someone more like his sister. But Nate, to his credit, used all of that negativity as motivation to better himself in his own way. He focused on his studies and spent hours diving deep into coding, learning everything he could about computers. He pushed through all the teasing and the constant comments from his family and eventually ended up at a top university. That's where we met. We both pursued degrees in tech and now, years later, we're both working in the industry. We've built a comfortable life for ourselves. We have great, well-paying jobs. And while I don't want to sound like I'm bragging, we've done really well. We've worked hard for everything we have. And we've created a life we're proud of completely from the ground up. On the other hand, S still lives at home with my in-laws, who take care of all her expenses. When I say all, I mean everything, her rent, groceries even her car payments. It's like she never really left the nest, and it doesn't seem like she's in any rush to. I don't want to sound harsh, but S has a track record of making questionable life choices. She had a daughter with her ex-boyfriend, who is now four years old. The relationship ended badly, from what I've gathered. They were on again, off again for a while before it finally ended, and when it did, she moved back in with my in-laws, who were more than happy to support her. Now, S is gearing up for her second marriage, and it's been a huge topic of conversation in the family. When she announced her engagement, I could see the excitement light up my in-laws' faces. They acted as if it was the best news ever, immediately jumping into planning mode, talking about venues, dresses, the guest list, the whole shebang. It felt like they were trying to recreate that magical wedding vibe she never had with her first relationship because she and her ex didn't have a traditional wedding. This time, she's determined to go all out, and my in-laws are more than willing to bankroll the entire event to make sure she has her dream day. I've been trying to keep things cordial with us, even though there's always been some tension between us. To be fair... We've mostly kept things civil, but there's always been this underlying resentment simmering beneath the surface. It's hard not to notice the stark contrast between how Nate and I handle our lives and how my in-laws handle hers. Nate and I are completely self-sufficient. We've worked hard, built our careers, and pay for everything ourselves. We have a nice apartment. We're saving up for a house, and we're planning for the future, all without any handouts. I think sometimes this disparity rubs S the wrong way. Even if she doesn't say it outright, you can tell from the way she talks about money, success, and what she thinks is fair. 
I was invited to her bachelorette dinner, which was described as a small, intimate gathering with her closest friends and family at a very fancy upscale restaurant in the city. This wasn't just any dinner spot. It was the kind of place you reserve for special occasions. The waiters wear suits, and the wine list features bottles that cost more than my monthly car payment. I thought it would be a nice night out, and, to be honest, I wanted to show I was making an effort to be supportive and happy for her. We might not be best friends, but she's Nate's sister, and that means something to me. So, I got ready, picked out a cute but not overly flashy outfit, and even bought a small, thoughtful gift for her. I chose a pretty bracelet that I thought would go well with her engagement ring, since I know she likes jewelry. I figured it was a safe bet. When I got to the restaurant, the atmosphere was exactly as I expected. Dim lighting, elegant decor, crystal chandeliers hanging from the ceiling, and soft classical music playing in the background. It was one of those places where every detail is meticulously planned to create a luxurious dining experience. The table was beautifully set with white linens, polished silverware, and tall candles. It looked beautiful, and for a moment I thought, okay, maybe this could actually be a nice night. I was one of the last to arrive, and when I got there, everyone was already sipping on champagne and laughing. S was in the middle of telling a story, gesturing animatedly, and when she saw me walk in, she lit up. I could tell she was in her element, surrounded by her friends and basking in all the attention. I handed her the gift, and she thanked me, giving me a quick hug before placing it on the table beside her. We exchanged the usual small talk, and I took my seat. The evening started off well enough. We ordered a round of cocktails, and there were plenty of appetizers being passed around, crab cakes, bruschetta, truffle fries. The conversation was flowing, and it seemed like everyone was in good spirits. I'll admit, I started to relax. Even though I wasn't super close with most of the women there, the atmosphere was light, and I was actually enjoying myself. S's friends were chatting about wedding plans, gossiping about old acquaintances, and keeping the mood upbeat. I began to think, hey, maybe this won't be so awkward after all. We ordered our entrees, and everything looked amazing. Lobster ravioli, filet mignon, duck confit. It was clear us had gone all out to make the night special, and I respected that. It's not every day you get to dine at a place like this, so I was more than happy to indulge a little. Then dessert came, beautiful little pastries, chocolate lava cakes, and fruit tarts. The presentation was perfect. We were all pretty stuffed at that point, but, of course... We found room for dessert. There was laughter, toast to the bride-to-be, and honestly, for a brief moment I thought, maybe this is a turning point. Maybe things can be friendly between us. It was one of those rare times when everything just seemed perfect, and I was glad I had come. But then, just as I was settling into the warm, contented glow of a good meal, the waiter came over. He was holding one of those sleek black leather folders, the kind fancy restaurants used to present the bill. Naturally, I assumed he was going to hand it to S, since she was the one who organized the whole evening. After all, she was the one who invited us. But no, he walked right past her and placed it directly in front of me. I remember just staring at this bill, absolutely dumbfounded. For a moment, I thought maybe it was a mistake, like the waiter got the tables mixed up or something. I sat there, my mind racing, trying to figure out what was going on when I heard S clear her throat. She leaned forward with this casual, almost smug expression and said, Oh, I forgot to mention, my parents and I were talking, and we thought you and Nate could handle the bill for this as a wedding gift, since you're not financially contributing to my wedding. I could feel my jaw drop. I was completely blindsided. In that moment, I couldn't even comprehend the audacity of what she was suggesting. Here we were, at this incredibly expensive restaurant, and she just casually decided that Nate and I would cover the entire bill for eight people without even bothering to ask us beforehand. It wasn't even a question. It was stated as if it was the most normal thing in the world. I didn't know what to say. I sat there, stunned, staring at the check folder in front of. Why doesn't your fiancé foot the bill? I asked, trying to keep my tone level though I could feel the tension building inside me. Or 
Maybe your parents should take care of it, since they're the ones who brought this idea to you. I was struggling to maintain my composure, but I could hear the sharpness creeping into my voice. I was angry, and I wasn't about to pretend otherwise. Her eyes widened in shock, as if I had just crossed a line she hadn't expected. She looked at me as if I had insulted her on some deep, personal level, and I almost found it amusing how taken aback she was. It was as if the very thought of someone pushing back against her had never even crossed her mind. She began to defend herself, her voice rising slightly as she spoke. You're the wealthiest ones in both my family and my fiancé's family. We didn't think you would act like this, her tone conveyed disbelief, as if I were being ridiculous for not simply agreeing to her request. It was clear that she genuinely didn't understand why I wasn't on board with her expectations. The way she framed it indicated that she had anticipated a different reaction from me. Perhaps she expected me to nod along, pull out my credit card, and tell the waiter to charge the bill to me with a smile. But that wasn't going to happen. I felt frustration bubbling within me, knowing I couldn't just sit there and let her walk all over me. Wait a minute, I replied, trying to maintain a steady voice despite the incredulity seeping in. You think it's our responsibility to pay for this entire dinner without even being asked beforehand? Just because Nate and I make decent money. I was hoping she might realize how absurd her expectation was, but instead, she doubled down. It's not about responsibility. It's about what's fair, she said, as of explaining a simple concept to a child. We all know you and Nate are doing well. You have good jobs. You're living comfortably. And it's not like we're asking you to pay for the wedding. This was just supposed to be a nice gesture, a contribution. I didn't think it would be such a big deal. That was when it hit me. She genuinely believed she was in the right. In her mind, this wasn't a huge, presumptuous request. It was a small, reasonable ask, and I was the one overreacting by not agreeing immediately. I could feel the weight of everyone's gaze at the table, the uncomfortable silence hanging in the air like a thick fog. Some of her friends were staring down at their drinks, avoiding eye contact, while others looked at me, clearly waiting to see how I would respond. Taking a deep breath to center myself, I said, if this was something you wanted, you should have brought it up with Nate and me beforehand. Springing this on me at the end of the meal is not okay. We came here to celebrate with you, not to be blindsided with the bill. If your parents suggested it, maybe they should have talked to us about it directly. My hands trembled slightly as I spoke, a mix of anger and nerves coursing through me. But I was done being polite. She stared at me, her expression shifting from confusion to annoyance. And then she said something that made my blood run cold. Well, maybe if you and Nate weren't so stingy, you'd actually contribute something to my wedding instead of just showing up. The smirk on her face felt like a provocation, as if she wanted me to lash out so she could portray herself as a victim. I could see some of her friends exchanging nervous glances, clearly uncomfortable with the escalating tension, yet no one spoke up. I was incredulous. Here I was, attempting to handle the situation with civility, yet she had the audacity to call us stingy. As if we hadn't already spent hundreds on gifts, travel, and countless other expenses just to support her wedding. The entitlement was staggering, and I could feel my heart pounding as I fought to keep my emotions in check. Who did she think she was? Suggesting that we were somehow obligated to fund her lifestyle and wedding celebrations simply because we had been financially successful. It was infuriating. I forced myself to take another breath, trying to steady my voice. You're right. We are doing well, but that doesn't mean we're obligated to pay for everything just because someone decides we should. That's not how this works, and it's certainly not how you ask for a favor. I could see her bristle at my words, and for a moment, I thought she might argue back. But instead, she sat there with her arms crossed, glaring at me as if I had ruined her night. Well, sorry, but I'm not your parents. Don't expect handouts from me. The word slipped out sharper than I intended, but I was beyond caring. I had tried to be polite, to express my point without causing a scene, and yet here she was, acting like it was my duty to fork over hundreds of dollars without a second thought. The way she looked at me, 
smirking with her arms crossed, made it clear she thought she had the upper hand, as if she expected me to fold and give in just because that was how everyone else around her behaved. But I wasn't playing that game. That's when she completely lost it. I could see her face flush with anger as her voice rose again. Are you serious? You're going to ruin my night over this? I thought you were supposed to be family, and you can't even do one nice thing without making a big deal out of it. God, you're so selfish. She spat the words at me, and I felt the tension in the room tighten. Everyone went dead silent, likely hoping that this whole situation would simply disappear if they ignored it hard enough. But there was no way I was going to let her steamroll over me. I stood up abruptly, pushing my chair back and grabbing my purse. I wasn't about to endure her berating me for not bending over backward to cater to her whims. Have fun paying for the bill, I said, striving to keep my voice steady even though I was absolutely seething inside. I handed my card to the waiter and instructed him to charge my half of the bill. I didn't even wait for a response from her. I could feel all eyes on me, but I didn't care. I paid for my share, tucked my card back in my wallet, and walked out of the restaurant leaving behind the stunned silence and the explosive mess I knew would have repercussions. The walk to my car felt like a blur. My heart was still pounding, and my hands were shaking as I replayed the evening's events over and over in my head, trying to make sense of it all and calm myself down. Part of me was furious, furious at her audacity, but another part of me was simply exhausted. Exhausted from the constant entitlement and the expectation that because we were financially stable, we should cover everything without question. It wasn't fair, and I was done pretending it was. When I got home, Nate could tell right away that something was wrong. How did dinner go? He asked, and I struggled to hold back the flood of frustration and disbelief as I recounted the entire ordeal. I described the moment the waiter handed me the bill, her smug assumption that we would cover it, and her angry outburst when I said no. I could see his expression change as I spoke. Curiosity shifting to shock, then to outright fury. He was trying to remain calm for my sake, but I noticed the tension in his jaw and the way he clenched his fist slightly as he listened. When I finished, there was a heavy silence. Nate took a deep breath and finally said, I can't believe she did that. I knew she could be entitled, but this is a whole new level. He shook his head, clearly struggling to process the entire situation. You were right to say no. I don't care what she or anyone else thinks. We're not just a bank account for her to dip into whenever she feels like it. This is ridiculous. Hearing him express his support was such a relief. A part of me had worried he might suggest I should have just gone along with it to keep the peace. But no, he was just as outraged as I was. Knowing he had my back made me feel a little less alone in all of this. We spent the rest of the night discussing how we wanted to handle things. Nate was adamant that I had done the right thing, and he was already considering whether we should even attend the wedding at all. If this is how she's going to treat you, trying to take advantage of us, then why should we support that, he said. I agreed with him. We had always known that his family tended to favor her, but this was a new level of entitlement, and I didn't want to set a precedent where she thought she could just demand whatever she wanted from us. The fallout was swift and brutal. The very next day, I received a call from my mother-in-law. The moment I heard her voice, I knew it wasn't going to be a pleasant conversation. She was fuming, practically yelling into the phone about how I had embarrassed Syl in front of her friends, how I had ruined her special night, and how I could be so heartless as to not contribute to the wedding in such a simple way. She just wanted a nice evening, and you turn it into a disaster, she said, framing me as a villain in this scenario. It was clear that Syl had spun the entire situation to paint herself as a victim, and now my mother.